So we're moving now to the third uh, lecture in uh, module number eight. Uh, module number eight is about the patterns of New Testament faith. And uh, we want to move now to the Redeemer of the Exodus, to the uh, concept of Jesus as a new Exodus, as a new Israel, new Moses, and so forth. And so this will be uh, quite a bit longer than the previous uh, video. Uh, because we're focusing on a lot more material. As I brought out before, uh, when we're doing typologies uh, in the New Testament, we want to be careful to have explicit reference first. In other words, we should be uh, aware that definitely the New Testament uh, is pointing us in a particular direction before we try to bring out every last detail of connection between Jesus and some Old Testament uh, character. So uh, uh, perhaps uh, we should start with such an explicit text, and that is Luke uh, chapter 9 and uh, verse 31, uh, and verse 30 as well. Uh, Luke chapter 9 and verses 30 and 31. It says, uh, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. It's the story of the transfiguration. And on top of the mountain, uh, Jesus meets Moses and Elijah, and they're having a conversation. And according to this, the conversation was about his departure uh, that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, that's, I think, a fair translation of the term uh, in the Greek, but it may be masks what the original reader would have noticed. And that is that the word for departure is exodos. Exodus. It's the exodus that Jesus was to reenact the exodus in Jerusalem in some way. The cross is associated with the exodus, that Jesus in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection, that he was modeling in a sense on the experience of Israel, uh, which was on the Egyptian shore and went down into the sea. Uh, walked through the sea and came out onto the other side. That the Exodus experience of Israel was a model for the cross. Now obviously that is not a literal model. It is a spiritual model. That the death and the resurrection, the burial of an individual uh, would somehow be related uh, to this uh, mighty historical event uh, in Israel's past. Jesus, of course, observes the Passover, and he transforms it into a new supper uh, that would, uh, in the future, be pointing back to him more than it was pointing to the Exodus. Uh, when uh, the Hebrew was celebrating the Passover, they would take the bread, the, uh, the matzo, and they would uh, divide it, and they say, this is the bread of affliction. Uh, they eat the matzo, the unleavened bread, uh, because their opportunity to escape was so sudden that they didn't have time to let the dough rise. Uh, so it would be a constant reminder that the exodus was a miracle. It was a sudden escape when they least expected it. So the Jew pronounces over the bread of Passover, this is the bread of affliction. Jesus takes the Passover bread and surprises them. He says, this is my body. This is me. I am what this Passover was all about. I'm what this exodus was all about. So in his pronouncement, this is my body, uh, Jesus is in a real sense taking over the Passover and applying it uh, to himself and to his experience. So the cross is associated with baptism. Uh, with the Passover, excuse me, but it's also associated with baptism because in baptism a person goes down into the water, is buried, so to speak, in the water, and comes out uh, 
on the other side. So in the Hebrew way of thinking, these were all equated with each other. Baptism, cross, exodus, Passover, uh, these are associated with each other. Uh, Paul says, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So in a real sense, for the disciples of Jesus, the cross replaces the exodus. It becomes the defining act of God. Throughout the Old Testament, whenever they were talking about the mighty acts of God, they usually had the exodus in view. The exodus was the greatest, mightiest act of God in the course of Old Testament history. But the New Testament correspondent to the exodus is the cross of Jesus Christ. There is God's greatest and mightiest act for us. So it's very, very clear that New Testament writers saw a connection uh, between Jesus and particularly the cross and uh, the Exodus. Related to this, Jesus is also a new Moses. And to see this clearly, let's go to Deuteronomy 18 and verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and 15, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. If I can get that next page to come up, there it is. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. So Moses, in his last sermon, says to the Israelites that uh, God will raise up for you a prophet like me. In Acts chapter 3, this very statement is applied to Jesus. Acts chapter 3 and verses 22 to 24. Acts chapter 3. And verses 22 to 24. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. So he, uh, Peter here is applying the statement in Deuteronomy 18 to the appearance of Jesus as the true prophet like Moses. And those who do not listen to that prophet, those who do not listen to Jesus, uh, they end up being the ones uh, who are cut off from God even though they thought uh, that they were faithful to God. So Jesus is parallel to Moses, and uh, in what way can we see this parallel? Well, it starts uh, right after birth, because it was as an infant that uh, there was a government edict that threatened the life of Moses. And that edict basically said that uh, every baby male that is born to the Hebrews will be thrown into the river. Well, Moses' mother did not want to lose him, but she was also obedient to the king's command, and so she arranged for Moses to be thrown in the river. So in a real sense, uh, she had fulfilled uh, the law that was there. But the interesting thing that happens is all the other babies were lost except Moses. And this tragic story is repeated uh, when you get to Matthew, uh, where you discover that... Uh, the very one targeted, Jesus, is the only one who escapes. There's a parallel between the story of Jesus and the story of Moses. In uh, John chapter 1, it says, No man has seen God at any time, but the one, the unique one who's in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus is the only one who has truly known what God is like. Uh, in Exodus 33, 
Uh, Moses doesn't get a face-to-face -face look at God, but he does get to see God from behind, so to speak. So Moses is the only character in the Old Testament that uh, sees God in any sense, but he gets the backside view. And in John 1.18, Jesus has the front side view. He's the one who's in the bosom of the Father. So Jesus is the one who understands the Father. He can see his eyes. He can feel his tone of voice. Uh, he is intimate with the Father. And in this sense, uh, Jesus transcends Moses. Uh, but uh, Moses is also uh, a powerful parallel for Jesus in his closeness to God. Moses fasted for 40 days and then uh, gave the law on a mountain. Jesus fasted for 40 days and then gave the Sermon on the Mount uh, to his people. Moses appointed uh, 70 elders. Jesus appointed 70 disciples to go out in Luke chapter 10. Moses is glorified on the mountain. So was Jesus transfigured on a mountain, Matthew 17. Uh, Moses fed a multitude in the desert uh, through the manna and the quail. And so Jesus also felt fed a multitude in the desert, according to John 6 and Matthew 14. Moses brought the water of life from a rock. Uh, Jesus uh, brought the water of life from himself. Uh, out of him flowed rivers of living water. John 3.14 tells us how Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and how Jesus is the parallel to that. It's interesting that in Matthew, Jesus' sayings are all grouped into five sermons, just like the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is, is five volumes about Moses and uh, the history that Moses was able to write. Uh, Matthew is about Jesus and the story of Jesus grouped into five sermons. So Matthew is deliberately seeing Jesus as a new Moses. And then finally, um, when you go to the Gospel of John, it's interesting that the miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John uh, directly parallel the miracles of uh, Moses in the plagues of Egypt. Moses turned water into blood. Jesus turns water into wine. Uh, Moses slays the firstborn son, but Jesus is uh, raised from the dead, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, if you compare the two, and I've done this in a number of other settings, uh, you'll see that the seven major miracles in the Gospel of John are all paralleled to plagues of the Exodus. So the New Testament writers saw Jesus as a new Moses as well as a new Exodus. We could go a step further and suggest that Jesus is also a new Israel. And this is particularly true with Matthew. Uh, Matthew uh, talks about Jesus being Mary's firstborn. And in Exodus, Israel is called uh, God's firstborn. Uh, Israel comes up out of Egypt. And Jesus himself comes up out of Egypt. He's taken down there for safekeeping, but because it's prophesied, uh, he has to go down to Egypt so he can come back out of Egypt. Uh, just as Israel passes through the waters, so Jesus passed through the waters on the day of his baptism. Uh, just as Moses and Israel spent 40 days uh, in the wilderness, so Jesus. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. And uh, so Jesus gives the law to a new Israel. Uh, Israel had 12 disciples. It's no coincidence, I think, that uh, the 12 sons of Israel and 12 disciples of Jesus are 12, in fact. Jesus could have picked 11 disciples, could have picked 13 disciples. 
But instead, he picks 12 because he wants to show this is a new Israel. The original Israel was Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. 12 sons became 12 tribes of Israel. But in the New Testament, Jesus is the new Israel. He's the new Jacob. And uh, his disciples are equivalent to the 12 tribes. In fact, Jesus even says to them in Matthew that one day you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's a real sense in which Jesus himself uh, could be seen as a new Israel. As such, Jesus passes over the same ground as Israel. He's the faithful covenant partner. Where Israel failed, Jesus succeeds. But at the same time, Jesus receives the consequences of Israel's sin. When you go to Deuteronomy 28, you see what those consequences would be. In Deuteronomy 28, uh, those who disobeyed God, an Israel that was disobedient, what would happen to them? And the answer is uh, Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 20. They would be in poverty. If they did not obey him, uh, they would be poor. God would withhold the, uh, uh, the blessings of riches. In verse 25 of Deuteronomy 28, it tells us that they would be smitten before their enemies, in front of the, or in the sight of their enemies. And Jesus on the cross was smitten in the presence of his enemies. Uh, another curse of the covenant is darkness, just as Jesus experienced on the cross. Uh, another of the curses, verse 30, is an adulterous wife. I'm reminded of Hosea and also the church of Jesus Christ. How difficult it is for a community of humans to stay faithful to Jesus Christ. According to Leviticus 28, excuse me, Deuteronomy 28, uh, the curses of the covenant included being mocked, being hungry, being thirsty, being naked, uh, all of these things are easy to connect with the cross. Verse 65 of Deuteronomy 28, it talks about a trembling heart, that uh, when, when you are disobedient to God, you'll have a trembling heart, and you, you won't know whether you're coming or going. And at night you'll say, oh, I wish it was day, and at day you'll say, oh, I wish it was night. And, and this reminds me of Gethsemane, how Jesus there reaped the insecurity that comes uh, from sin. Other curses uh, in, uh, in the Bible are earthquakes, uh, being cut off from the community, hanging on a tree, and uh, all of these are applied to Jesus in one form or another. You see, uh, what we see in the New Testament is Jesus seen as the one who exhausts the curses of the covenant. He takes upon himself all the consequences of Israel's sins. He is truly the new Israel, not only in that he succeeds where the old Israel failed, but also that uh, he reaps the consequences of Israel's sin. So once again, we see the reversal, that an Israel who has disobeyed and therefore deserves death uh, that same Israel comes face to face with a Messiah who obeyed and therefore deserves the blessing. And because of that great reversal, that the one who obeyed lived, excuse me, the one who obeyed died, so that the ones who disobey might live. Uh, that's uh, what comes through clearly in all these typologies. So in many ways, Jesus takes the place of Israel. This is at the core of biblical salvation teaching, this, this connection, this typology between Jesus and the whole life and history of the people of God in Old Testament times. Jesus is not only a new Israel, a new Moses, a new Exodus, but he's also a new Joshua. And I think it's pretty well known today that the name Jesus really is Joshua, Yehoshua in, 
Hebrew becomes Jesus in Greek. And so the name Jesus is a Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua. So Jesus is a new Joshua. While the law of Moses couldn't get the people into the promised land, and Moses himself couldn't get the people into the promised land, uh, Joshua did. Joshua did succeed. And uh, in a real sense, at the transfiguration, Jesus is portrayed as a new Joshua. Moses comes on the Mount of Transfiguration to pass the baton to Jesus. He would become the new Isaac, uh, excuse me, he would become the new Joshua that would take his people into the Promised Land because of the coming of Jesus, because of the Messiah. Uh, those who follow Jesus can look forward to the Promised Land, the Promised Eternity. So we see that in so many ways Jesus has become the Redeemer of the Exodus. Uh, he is not only the redeemer of creation, he's not only the redeemer of Abraham and Isaac, the patriarchs, he's also the redeemer of the Exodus. And what we'll do when we return in the next lecture is uh, continue on into the monarchy period, a period that we've covered earlier, and uh, looking into the monarchy period, see other ways in which uh, a typology of Jesus Christ uh, works itself out in the New Testament. So that will uh, bring this lecture to a close, uh, number seven, excuse me, number eight, and uh, letter C, uh, the Redeemer of the Exodus.